Well, good morning, church. You ready to hear God's word? All right, good. Thank you. Always nice when you say that. Uh, hey, let's welcome the campuses that are joining us. Bronx Park, North End, West Campus, and online. Give them a shout. Okay, we're going to test and see if you've been awake this last three, four weeks. We are talking about the vision statement for the church. And really, it's kind of like, why do we do what we're doing? Right? It's just to come here and listen to somebody. No. Right? That would miss the whole point. We, there are some things that we want to help people do and we help ourselves do. And uh, it would be three things. Are you remembering? Is it sort of coming back to you? Somebody said, it's like live free and die hard. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that's not quite it. So the three things we're, we're going to put on the screen in just a little bit is know God. Oh, we put up with live free and find purpose. You can read. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been talking about how do we do those things, and, and uh, we're going to do uh, kind of just springboard off of that, and in fact, on the campuses, you guys are going to have your pastors over the next year are going to be talking about some of those things and sort of sharpening that focus for us, because it is, it is what we do, it's how we do it, and we want us uh, all to really grab a hold of it and get it and live it and have it to become a part of who we are. So today, we're going to be talking a little more about freedom and what that actually means. And uh, part of what I want to encourage you in is this, is to have your discernment really sharp on the fact that there is a world's definition of freedom, and there is God's definition of freedom, and they actually could not be farther apart. Like, and I want you to think about this, and I think it would be impossible for us not to have been influenced by the world's definition of freedom, because it is so pervasive in, in what we're doing. And, and there's a picture that I'm going to paint for you of what the world's definition is, and then we're going to spend most of our time talking about what God's definition of freedom is and how you get there. And it's one of those crazy inverse things about the kingdom of God that is kind of counterintuitive. You would not think that you will become more free by becoming a servant, right? That doesn't make any sense at all. But it's exactly the way we get freedom, and it's exactly what God has for us in store. And the more you learn to serve the king, the more free you become. And uh, as we kind of swirl around that, I want you to be aware and think about the fact that all of us have had that other definition of freedom kind of come to us, and it's been poured into us uh, in how we live, in what we do, in our societies. Most of our media comes from the land of the free and the home of the brave, right? And so there's a particular bent that comes out of Hollywood and that thinking, and uh, we, we and Manitoba should know this, we are the true north, strong and free, right? And we have a particular bent in Canada as well, what we think freedom should be. All of that is actually bondage, according to the Bible. And, and there's a, such a powerful, distinct line between what the world thinks what freedom is and what God says freedom is. And here's where we're going to end off, is there are seven words that Jesus has said that are going to be the key to your uh, discerning the different kinds of freedom and the, the, the key to you living absolutely free no matter what your circumstances are in life. Because freedom can never be connected to circumstances, right? Because then somebody else can put you in bondage. And Jesus didn't come to die for you to be in bondage to someone else or something else. He came so you could be free starting on the inside and moving out. So no matter what happens in life, I am free. Because Christ died for me. Yeah, that would be a good time for an amen. Just... And we can continue to just kind of flow in that if you want, okay? Uh, so what's the world's definition of freedom? It, it has a, I've, I've said it kind of into two, word, into two phrases. One is uh, unfettered autonomy. If, if there was a way that we would want to say the world's do is I want to make my decisions, I want to have all the options, I want to set the agenda, no one is going to tell me what to do, you are not the boss of me, right? And is, as I'm saying that, you think, that sounds good, <laughs> I would love to live my life to have no boss. And it starts when you're very young, right? And you grow as you get older. Now, here's the folly with that. If you're in charge, 
stuff like this happens. And some of you, some of the guys in the first service are going, I think I can do it. I'm in. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is a problem when we are the boss. And, and we don't have to think very far and we don't have to live very long to realize that there is a selfish nature inside of us that just focuses on ourself and it actually leads to bondage. And God's answer to us is to saying, the world's way is self-autonomy, like I'm in charge. God says, you know, I actually designed you for me to be in charge, for you to let go and to trust me and let me take you to who you were supposed to be. And, and I think if you're honest, there's a huge struggle between those things in our life. I am always pulled that way. I love being in charge. Hi, my name's Aubrey. <laughs> and, and you can confess that to whoever you'd like to confess to as well. Um, it is part of who we are. So there's the autonomy is one thing. The, the second definition of the world's way of looking at it is unlimited options. I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and with whom I want to do it. And I want to have all the possible options open to me. That's what freedom really means, right? I want to have all of it. Oh, yes, right? <laughs> Can you imagine how wired that kid would be if he had any little bit of that sugar, <laughs> right? Uh, we want to have all of the options available to us. That's what freedom is. And I think if we're honest, we would say, that kind of sounds good. I'd like to have all the options in front of me. This, I, I saw some really, really interesting kind of ways that that worked out. Uh, my wife and I have never done this before, but we uh, decided that we were going to go, when we were down for uh, a conference in Florida, that we were going to go on a cruise. And never been there before, and I, and I kind of talked my wife into it, so I was really hoping it would go well. And uh, we come on, and these people are paid to be your best friend, right? And they were calling me by name, and they did everything for me, and there was this endless food, and I, this was like amazing, right? I thought, this is perfect. And I, so I'm talking to one guy, and we were talking about how great this was, and he said, do you know that there are restaurants open 24 hours a day? And you can have food all the time. And he and I were about the same size, right? So we're, we're loving of this, we're having this. And every time I would see him, he would have a plate of food in front of him, right? It was the, the, the 9 o'clock pizza, the, this is at night. You know, the 10 o'clock Chinese, the 11 o'clock, he just keep going, he had this food. And he said, you know, and I met him the other day at, near the end, and he said, you know what the problem is? I'm actually still hungry all the time. I still want more. Ooh. Hmm. It's the problem, isn't it? Is that some of those things can never be satisfied. And what they do is they actually become a bondage in our life that I have to, have to, have to, have to have more because they were never meant to be fulfilled in that way. There's a little side picture that I had, and I'm not sure it completely fits, but I thought it was funny. Is uh, we, were, we were in Key West and we just started and so we're, we're heading off, and uh, there is, if you've ever been to Key West before, there's one street called the Duval Street, and you can do the Duval Crawl, which is you can pub hop from one thing to another. Now, we came around 8 o'clock. The bar's open at 7 a.m. So there you go, 7 o'clock in the morning, you start the crawl, right? And so these people started the crawl, and they went all the way through, and as the ship was leaving, we were waving to them because they missed the boat. <laughs> but they had a great crawl, right? And, uh, you know, I thought that, hmm, that's kind of a little picture, isn't it? Is that we get, get so caught up in this stuff that seems like that's freedom. But we actually miss what true freedom is. We actually miss how God designed us to live, the things and the pieces that he has for us. And, and that definition actually falls really flat. I remember, uh, if you think about it, you look in scripture, it actually started right from the beginning. If you look at the Garden of Eden, uh, that was as close as you could possibly get. We call it paradise, right? And they had anything that they could do they wanted, pretty much everything that they could go they wanted. They had like one little thing, right, that they couldn't do. It, it was perfect. It was like naked and unashamed. Woo! Right? They could just go around and, and nobody knew they were naked. It was perfect. Some of you are going, oh, that part of the story's coming. Just wait. And so they do this, but, but even in that absolutely idyllic setting 
where you think freedom was just completely laid out before you, it couldn't happen. There's a, a friend of mine who was, who was talking about how they now have an uh, empty nest. And we were a few years back, and we were asking them how it was because our boys were leaving for the fifth time. And, uh, <laughs> and so they said, oh, it's great. The, the husband was just extolling, the, you know, the kids are gone. You can do whatever you want. You can, you know, it's just fantastic. He says, and the best thing, like the best thing is I get up in the morning. If I don't feel like putting pants on, I don't put pants on. <laughs> and his wife just, you know, rolls her eyes and he's going on and on. Al Fresco, man, this is fantastic, right? And as he turns around and leaves, his wife looks at me and goes, pray for You know, your freedom might actually be somebody else's bondage. You realize that, right? <laughs> so, guys, how do we do it right? What is it in God's definition that really is the right way to do it? I'm, I'm just a few things that I want you to think about because there is uh, like a shallow end and a deep end to freedom. Uh, John chapter 8 is coming up on the screen. And uh, this is what Jesus said. And it's sort of that reminder of the two things. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, one, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. Anybody committed a sin? Yeah, yeah, hmm, there you go. Uh, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So the, what the son, if the son has set you free, you are free indeed. Now, you know the last verse, did, did you get that? That... That he says, if you, he's putting the, the spiritual freedom piece together and he ties it into relationship. You know, if you are going to sin and you will, and, and one version says, if you practice sin, and going, yep, yeah, I practice sin, <laughs> right? We, we, we do. We, we do that, and if you do that, you become a slave to it. But he, and then he starts talking about a relationship, but he says, if, and slaves can't be part of the house. But if you're a son or a daughter, if you're with God and he has set you free from just doing whatever you want, when you want, being in charge all the time, then you actually belong in the house. Then you have a relationship with God and you can live like you're supposed to live. And if he has set you free, then you are completely free. So actually freedom isn't doing what I want, when I want, with who I want, how I want. It actually has a whole lot more to do with bending my knee and saying, I realize that if I'm really going to be free, I am going to need to be a, the, the real word is slave. Hmm. We sometimes translate it as servant because the slave makes us think of terrible masters, right? But the word is actually slave. Slave. Is actually somebody who doesn't own themselves. They have chosen to give themselves to someone else and they are, no, they are no longer theirs. And I think it's a pretty sobering thing, isn't it? That we say, if I want to be free, I need to become a slave. It's almost, it's almost too hard to wrap our heads around that, isn't it? And, and the word that we've translated into is servant where I need to learn to serve God. And actually, Paul says, you know, I, I'm good to be a servant to all of you. I'm, I'm good with that. D do you see now when you'd compare the definitions, though, guys, how when, what we thought was real freedom, I can do whatever I want when I want, actually leads to bondage. But in bringing ourselves under a heavenly father who knows how to give good gifts and who actually made us and cares for us and has good things in our life, if we submit to him, that's where we actually find freedom. You aren't going to hear this anywhere else. You are not going to hear it outside these walls. Because this is not the, the, this is, this, the lie that Satan has whispered into our society is that you need to be in charge. And what Jesus said, if you want the son to set you free, you need to come down and you need to release to me your life. You need to die. You need to become a slave. And even in thinking about this, I thought, you know, can I use that word? 
Because that image is not good, is it? But as you think about it, I want you to think about your heavenly father. What are, what are other words that we use for God? King. And he is a good king. And the only way that we can really find freedom is if we bend our knee to that king and say, I'm going to give my life to you. And one of the things that, that we discover as we live is that that is a journey to learn how to release our lives to God and to just say, okay, God, I, I give it to you. Most of the time we grab a hold again and we want to say, okay, yeah, I, I may be in this area. And sometimes we don't actually know, do we? What does God want us to do? And, and we get conformed into the pattern of this world. And he says, no, no, I want you to be transformed. I don't want you to live like everybody else lives, where power is important and shiny things are important and having people look at you the right way is important. I, I, was, I was talking to one of the hairdressers in our church, and she said something absolutely fascinating. It's grad season, right? And uh, there were these young ladies who would come to her to get their hair done. And she said there was, the, the Christian girls came to her and those who didn't know Christ came to her and she said it was absolutely fascinating in her particular setting. The Christian girls who came, got their hair done, they looked beautiful, they were great, and they went away and had a good time was kind of their deal. She says some of the, like, she says almost every one of those other girls that came, they had to do like, you ladies, forgive me, I won't have the right words here, but like the test run right, where you do a couple days beforehand, you do it to see whether it looks absolutely perfect, and then you do the real run, where you get it, everything done, and you get it done, and there was just this obsession about outside beauty, and everything wasn't perfect. You know why? Because it's an impossible Hollywood lie that everything is perfect, and these poor young girls were trapped in it. The only beauty they thought they had was outside beauty. Guys, isn't that terrible? You're 17 years old and you think all you have is what's outside and then you compare yourself to somebody else and it's horrible. And these other girls had a confidence in themselves. They realized that, you know, the, the outside beauty is what it is. But you know what? There's something else that I have that's beautiful in me. And I thought, wow, isn't that amazing? Bondage, freedom in a really simple thing like getting ready for grad. There's a, a, a shallow end to the way we do this and a deep end. And, and I'm going to give you an example of sort of the shallow end of how we really make this happen. Take a look up on the screen and you'll see the video there. The God we serve is the all-powerful creator of the universe. He loves us and watches over us. And there are things he expects of us. The Bible says we must submit to God but it doesn't tell us what we have to submit to him. It's probably some kind of paperwork. So here are some things you should submit to God. A list of things you want for Christmas. A blank lottery ticket to fill out. A list of all the people that have wronged you with a big lightning bolt drawn on the side. You can also submit to God a copy of your birth certificate for emergencies. There are many different things you can submit to God, and I don't think it matters what you give Him as long as you submit to Him. These have been Deep Thoughts from a Shallow Christian. Wait, that's really, really the shallow end of things, right? Uh, and, and here's the thing, you can actually hang out in the shallow end, right? And, and if we were kind of honest, we would say, yeah, I do sometimes. I, you know, submitting to God, being a servant, yeah. I'd rather just go to work and bury myself in that. Or like lots of shiny things. I like shiny things. Uh, but there's a deep end that actually brings freedom. Do you want to jump in? Let's do it. What, is, what does the deep end look like? If, if we take a look at it, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, I am Paul, a servant or a slave, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of Christ. In, in Philippians 4, 11 to 13, he, he says something, and this is kind of where is deep end stuff, right? He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I have. So stuff isn't what makes you free. 
knowing what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to be in plenty. I have learned the secret to being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do, ooh, this one we know, all things through Christ who strengthens me. So Paul basically says, you know what? If I'm, if I'm alive, that's great for you because I can help you as a church. If I'm dead, woo great for me. Is this guy free or what? Right? He doesn't even worry about it. So if I have a lot of stuff, that's great. I can eat and, you know, I feel nourished. If I don't, no big deal. I kind of learned how to do that. I think for most of us, we have no idea what that means. <laughs> my refrigerator is completely full. My biggest problem is I go to Costco and then I got no place to put everything. Because I buy 14 of everything. <laughs> I need this. <laughs> But Paul says, you know what, there's a whole different way to look at freedom where you transcend. This is like deep end. He says, you know, I've actually learned this. I don't need to, I don't need to have this. Freedom isn't having all the choices and being able to do. Freedom is actually saying, God, I'm going to submit my life to you. Where was Paul? He, he spent a lot of time in prison. What did he do when he was in prison? Uh, wrote the Bible. Seems like a good thing, Right? So if you step back from his life, and if you step back from your life, a lot of the things that you thought were just this terrible stuff, God, because he's the king and he rules, and you're the servant, and you can say, yes, Lord, he actually takes all those things and he makes good out of them. But you actually have to go into the deep end, guys, and trust. You have to go into the deep end and say, I am willing to be a servant of all. I'm not going to worry about position. I'm not going to worry about what I have or don't have. I'm going to just be content, God, and I'm going to trust that you are going to bring into my life what's best for me. You rule. Yeah. That's hard, isn't it? And and it it is deep end stuff. And and the encouragement that I want to bring to you is this. In that internal freedom, and as we look into uh, a part of this passage... If you are struggling in this area, and if you're saying, boy, I don't, I'm not even sure I do this good at all, I have a small piece of encouragement for you. Did you know that Jesus struggled? You think, mm, no, he did. I, the, the story I'm going to tell you, we're going to read the scripture in a second, and it's going to contain those seven words, is Jesus was living his whole life with a focus to go to die on the cross for you and for me, to, die, to save us. That's what his whole life was about, right? That's why he came to earth, to do that. And he was living his whole life, and as time got closer and closer, he was coming, and he came into the garden of Gethsemane, he had, and he asked his disciples to come with him, and he, he left one group close by, and he said, would you pray for me? Jesus needed prayer. Hmm. And then he asked his, his closest friends to come and to be with him and pray. And and then there's this sort of this crazy scene that goes on where Jesus is like weeping and crying out and his friends are sleeping. (laughs) Thinking, I'm tired, we had a bad day. We had to watch Jesus heal everybody. I'm gonna catch a nap, right? (laughs) And and, and over here, Jesus is, is, is wrecked. And he says, God, is there any way, and the, the cup is, is, this, is this way of accomplishing your salvation, is there any way that this cup can be taken from me? He's struggling. Do you get that? If you struggle, it's okay. This is hard stuff. Getting rid of your own self. No, Jesus wasn't getting rid of his self, but he knew what was happening. He was standing at the precipice of the furnace of God's wrath and sin about to be poured out of all humanity, about to be poured onto him. And in that moment, he said, God, is there any way? He said, Abba, Daddy, Father, is there any other way that we can do this? Because he had been like in a way that none of us can understand, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. He had been connected in a way like you will only be connected in the future, and that connection was about to be severed. And he was going to take all of your sin on him. And he just said, God, is there any way? Dad. And then he said those seven words. I think you know them, or you might. Not my will, 
but yours be done. And he didn't do it because God told him to. He didn't do it because there was no other choice. He did it because he looked into the soul of every human and he looked into the eyes of his father and he loved everyone. And so he stepped into that furnace for you and I. Not my will, but yours be done. It, it's actually, guys, what the way we do it. it. It's how we choose every day to live our lives as a servant, as a slave of Christ. And, and I want to just unpack this for just a few minutes for you because I, I think there's a few ways that we can respond when we're in those situations. See, I always, I always thought that Jesus, when he wanted to know what to do, he would just look on his wrist and his wrist would say, WWID. <laughs> and he'd go, oh, go, I'm good. <laughs> what would I do? <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> I know that's bad, right? <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> He didn't have a what would, what would Jesus do wristband. He had to sort of work it out. And, and here's the thing, like all the cliche thing aside, uh, you know, if your wristband helps you, that's great. You, you have to do the hard work of really getting to know Jesus, of loving him and laying your life before him. If you're actually going to know what to do, it's about love. And, and it's about that. It's not about following rules. Please, please, please don't fall, change your, your non-world rules or your worldly rules for your Christian rules. You've missed it. God says, I want you to be in a relationship with me. I want to be your king. I want to be your friend. I want to be your lover. Don't just go to church because you have to. Right? Go there because you get to hang out with people and you get to be a blessing and do the things that you want to do. See, there are three ways when we're confronted with life. There are three things that we can do. And uh, we're going to see how, how Jesus confronted them. The first thing that we can do is run away. We can change circumstances. And I, I know sometimes we have to because it's, it's a, a good thing to do. But most of the time, it's, it's just a pattern that we fall into in life. That when things get tough, we just... Pew, and, and find someplace else. And, and guess what happens? Six months later, you're in the same situation because the real problem is, yeah. It almost looked like Jesus was going to do that, didn't he? He said, can you take this cup from me? Because he was really struggling. But he didn't. Because he loved the Father and he loved you. The, the second thing that, that we sometimes do is, is we just suppress our desires. We just say, okay, I'm just not going to feel, I'm not going to think, I'm going to put my fake Christian smile on, and I'm going to make it happen. The problem with that is, is that you were designed to love. And, and if you stop loving, you actually stop being like Jesus. And you're just grinding it out. That isn't what Jesus did, is it? He said, not my will, but yours be done. So what did he actually do? He loved into it. He said, you know what? There has to be love's answer to this question. And he went to the cross, and he bore everything that, he, that you and I couldn't bear, and he loved into it in a way that the power of God came in and through and around him. Guys, that's our answer. C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says, the Christians almost never pray the way God wants them to pray. What they'll pray for is a little bit of grace to get through whatever problem that they're experiencing at the moment and, and maybe a picture of life without that problem and say, God, would you make it that way? And, and they think that somehow desperately this time, if they grab a hold of the wheel and, of their life and squeeze even tighter, that that's going to make the difference. Instead of saying those seven words, not your will be done. Not my will be done, but yours. And let go. And then really live in the freedom of not worrying about what other people think, in the freedom of not having to live your life for power and money and all those things that everybody chases after 
but to live your life the way you were designed to live, a servant of Jesus Christ, free, free to experience everything that the world can't possibly offer you because it was never designed to do that. If the Son will set you free, you will be free indeed. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand? Hey, folks, we have, have just a few minutes. And so I want to do this with you. Um, maybe I'll do it in this order. And if you get tired, you can sit down. Uh, up on the screen are, are coming some things that I would like you to practice this week. Okay? Uh, I, I would like you to do this because this isn't just a theoretical message. This is life. I'd like you to submit a decision or a weakness to a trustworthy friend. And, and here's the thing. I'd like you to actually do what they say. Okay? Because sometimes it's easy to get people's opinions and then just forget. We do that. Uh, I'd like you to start, think about starting your day, and you can take a picture of it if you like. This is good, right? This is why we have cameras. This is why God created cameras. <laughs> start your day with, thank you, God, uh, that I don't have to make life work, that I can follow your lead. Third thing, I would, I would like you to let someone cut in front of you in line or in traffic. That, that, that's actually called merging. In Winnipeg, we're very confused. <laughs> the whole, we can't seem to get it. It's actually okay. And, and you know what the weird thing is? God actually challenged me to do that because I always like to be in the front. doesn't matter whether I'm winning. I just want to be in the front. <laughs> just a little neurotic. Yeah. And said, why don't you let somebody in? So I'm letting people in all over the place now. It's painful. Okay. What is, what is love's answer to this question? I'm not, going to suppress, I'm not going to say I don't want to do this. I'm not going to suppress it. I, I'm not going to just change my circumstances to make it go away. What, would, what is love's answer to this question? What does real love look like in this situation? Uh, what are God's thoughts? It is almost astounding how little time we take to just say, God, what do you say about this situation? We're so busy conquering the world and doing our stuff and making it happen. And it's kind of like God saying, hey, hello, I'm here. If you lack wisdom, ask. And uh, lastly, when you're going through something, evaluate. take some time to just evaluate. Am I running away? Am I squashing my desires or am I loving through it? So here's how we're going to end. All of us have things in our life that we could use some guidance for. If you don't have to go somewhere, please don't. And if you want to sit, that's okay too. Uh, why don't we take a moment to just be quiet before God? You know that he wants to speak to you, right? And help you. And this might be just a little, little bit of a piece for you that you might have to extend later. And, and you can start off by saying, not my will, but yours be done. And just be quiet. We're going to do that together. <laughs> Father, I thank you that the bondage of sin, the control of Satan, the entrapment of the world, circumstances and people controlling our peace, the curse of death, condemnation, all of those things are washed away as we understand that we are actually free. That we are free to love people, that we don't have to live like the world lives. God, we want to say out loud, this is hard work and we sometimes don't do real well. But I thank you that you are walking us on a journey and that, that it is for that freedom that you died. I thank you, God, that we can be different than the rest of the world and that that different is strong and full and free. Lord, I pray for everybody who has, has had the courage this morning to say, I got this thing and God, I need your help. I thank you that you will speak. 
whether it's through your word or your people or your spirit inside of them. 